Hello everyone. On November the 25th, Mercury will be aligned with Ras Ahagu, which is the alpha star of Ophiuchus. And Ophiuchus, the constellation itself, is very strongly related to healing. And in the meanwhile, Mercury is out of bounds, so it's really a very special moment. I gave uh, the title to, uh, to this video, uh, The Gates of healing are opening something like that maybe not uh i never remember what i uh what i actually did uh here yeah the gates of healing or the gate of healing mercury on rust Ahagu. so that is uh ophiuchus or serpentarius that's another word for it and this is a very funny drawing if you take a look first of all uh, you see a figure. This is uh, probably Asclepius uh, uh, that it was depicted. And uh, you see the, the um, head and the tail of the um, snake, the serpent. And the serpent has many connotations which, which are more or less sexual as well. Look at the picture and look where this, the snake is being held, let's put it this way, between his legs. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, so it, it it does have this sexual connotation, but at the same time, healing is its main property. And uh, the uh, the figure of the serpent holder of Ophiuchus is linked to lost knowledge, lost healing knowledge, because many many times uh, uh, the the constellation is depicted as a figure who hides the snake behind him. So part of the snake is not visible, only the head and the tail. And it, de it describes a metaphor for lost or broken knowledge about healing. Now, what happens when a uh, planet or, or the luminaries are aligned with a, a fixed star? First of all, you need to remember that fixed stars travel only one degree every 72 years so it's really really very very slow so nothing really occurs uh, within one year i think um, they travel 52 seconds of an arc think about it it's really really very very tiny and uh, mercury will be exactly on the uh, zodiacal position of ras ahagu at uh, uh, 23 um um uh, hours 23 hours and one minute something like that or exactly 11 p.m and uh, this means that before and after uh one day the this gate is open but this is the exact moment so we are going to look at the exact moment now the name uh is interesting because uh ras agu in arabic means the serpent charmer's head and again if you think about the serpent charmer how the serpent charmer makes uh, the uh, the serpent, the snake, straighten up. And again, you have this image, which is very heavily sexual. And it does hint on the fact that if you have a sexual life that is healthy and happy, then your health and happiness is always restored. You can always restore your happiness and, and health through it. But of course, uh, it's... It, the whole constellation is linked to healing. At the moment, uh, uh, Alpha Ophiuchus is at 22 degrees and 46 minutes in Gemini, and Mercury will be there. And as I said, it's, it's a two-day window. Let's take a look at uh, the, the planetarium. And as you can see, um, they are nowhere near each other. So this is just the zodiacal position okay on the ecliptic but as you can see mercury is right right now out of bounds quite out of bounds it's at minus 26 degrees and 41 so here is here is the edge of the uh the, the uh, uh ecliptic okay so here's the uh, that's the winter, winter solstice point and mercury is right here two and a half degrees away from the solstice point and ras ahagu is on the northern hemisphere around 12 degrees to the north from the uh, uh, celestial equators okay so this is this is um, uh, the placement and as you can see no they are not conjunct it's very, that's why it's important to remember that a zodiacal pos position for a star doesn't mean that they are nowhere near each other it could be way in in a different here it's a different hemisphere really 
Okay, let's take a look at the London chart. So this is the London moment, and uh, here it is. And as you can see, uh, the angles are heavily emphasized in this particular chart. We have a Virgo rising, so the retrograde Chiron at the edge of, of the, uh, actually at the cusp of the uh, ninth house, because it's technically in the eighth, but really uh, we take it into consideration in, in the ninth house is ruling this chart because the comic astrological ruler for Virgo is Chiron. And as you can see, the two strong feminine archetypes, Transpluto, which is Persephone, the, the psychopomp, and uh, Black Moon Lilith, which is uh, Adam's first wife, are still um, in, in a conjunction and they are rising. And Saturn is setting on the other side at the, the, the descendant. The descendant could mean your particular relationship, uh, your partner, but also your open enemies. And in a mundane situation, in a mundane sense, of course, it is the devouring parties. And on the mid heaven in the London chart, you have Uranus. And as you can see, uh, Aries north north conjunction is still very, very tight. Uh, Pluto is uh, aligned, I would say, with uh, the vertex. Just the the uh, vertex is the point of no um, free will. The uh, Sun Mars Sarah's conjunction is already separating. The Sun is around three degrees of, uh, away from it, and Mars Sarah's is already in Sagittarius, so where the uh, uh, the Sun was uh, in the previous video. And uh, another thing that is may that may be interesting is that Dark Moon Lilith, which is in the Lilith myth the acceptance of the curse, is on Australia, the Karma Breaker, the Destiny Changer. And uh, you may remember that for weeks, Vesta and Astra traveled together. There was a Vesta-Astra conjunction, so we could focus Vesta on karma breaking, destiny changing. At the moment, uh, we can change our destiny around all kinds of curses. And this is the acceptance of the curse. So it doesn't mean, Dark Moly doesn't mean that someone cursed you or you are being cursed. No, it means that you enter into a situation and you do whatever you damn well please and you don't care even if someone curses you. So that's the uh, that's the um, explanation. Okay, let's take a look because we have a forceps. It's, it really looks like a forceps. It is it is uh, um, made by a combi the combination of a dissolved opposition and a little engine. Let's take it apart. Let's take a look at the dissolved uh, opposition. It's the nodal axis with Aries. And Mercury is dissolving the tension here. And uh, uh, at the same time, it is in a little engine. Uh, and you, you may remember an engine is made up by a square, a quincunx, and a trine. And instead of a trine, you have a sextile in the little engine. So it's less of the blessings energy and more of the potential energy. So now Mercury, which is a psychopomp, which is also out of bounds, so it's it's out there. I forgot to tell you that, that any planet, if you have a planet that is out of bounds in your, in your chart, it usually means that um, uh, in a previous lifetime, uh, you suffered extreme pain uh, regarding that particular archetypal, archetypal situation. And at the moment, this is what's happening. And if you look at Mercury, Mercury is understanding, knowledge, communication, and also children. And if you look around what's happening to children in these two prominent wars at the moment and, and several other wars, and it's always the children who are suffering the most. And, and also communication, if you think about this. There are things that you can't even talk about. You can't even dis discuss. There are things that you are no longer able to discuss openly and properly in the world because you are labeled something, something horrible. So the little engine here uh, has a, a, a Mercury at its most prominent point because that is where the sextile and the square are meeting. And that's the essence of a little engine. The, uh, the green cones gives you the karmic edge. And here, this is a uh, mutable square between Mercury and Neptune. And Mercury and Neptune squares usually define three different things. That are, they're kind of similar, but uh, they pan out in a different way. One could mean 
if you have a Mercury Neptune square, that you are very gullible, that people can cheat on you, people can can lie to you, and you always you you always fall prey to them. The other potential is that you are unable to drive properly. So you have a lot of accidents or as a result, you simply don't like to drive. You don't dare to drive because you are afraid of accidents because you, you either caused uh, or you just narrowly missed a couple of really bad ones. And the third is that you, you, you don't trust your instincts. So you could have a premonition or you could have a dream or or you might sense something, Neptune, but then you rationalize it with Mercury and you say, no, it's not going to happen. No, it's not true. Something like that. So all three could uh, occur with the Mercury Neptune. At this particular moment, this Mercury is squared by Neptune, which means that uh, even if we believe in this healing energy, even if we believe that, yes, our life can be healed, our energy can be healed. And by the way, another thing that I forgot to tell, uh, I started to, but then I got disrupted, disrupted, dis misguided, whatever. Uh, why is it important that Mercury is channeling for us uh, the energy of Ras Ahagyu? Uh, I usually say that with the luminaries, it's a much stronger position because the sun illuminates it and uh, so does uh, the moon. If the sun is aligned with a fixed star, it, you can cons consciously download its energy and its healing or other potentials to, uh, to the earth plane for yourself. And with the moon, you can do it on a psychic level. And uh, those are really the ve very best positions. But with Mercury, you could actually understand it. You could actually make it uh, more understandable and graspable and, and acceptable for yourself. And so that's why uh, I was very happy that Mercury uh, was at this position because yes, it gives us a potential to heal, not just on a personal level, on a universal level. Even though the Mercury-Neptune square suggests that we won't understand each other and we won't understand what is happening. Still, Merc this Mercury is out of bounds. This Mercury is the psychopomp and this Mercury is aligned with a fixed star of healing. Okay, uh, let's take a look at the transcendental celestial objects. Here they are. And uh, Mercury has a number of ones and a number of really beautiful ones. Uh, for instance, it has Khufu and Shekmet, two Egyptian archetypes. So there's Egyptian knowledge involved in the space-time moment. There's also gratia or gracia, which means grace, uh, unlimited grace coming from above, coming, coming from God. Nymph, who is a uh, who is an elemental. Uh, nymphs are are uh, are that they are not human and they are not gods. They are kind of in between, and they don't belong to the human levels, they belong to the celestial levels, but still they live in very earthy uh, conditions, either in woods or in waters or in, in seas and oceans and whatever. So it is a uh, it is a, an elemental that can help you, let's put it this way. And uh, Thales, who was a uh, uh, Greek philosopher and mathematician. So those are the ones that are opening this, this gate of healing. And then on Neptune, you have Pandora, and Pandora was very prominent at the outbreak of the uh, uh, Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Uh, and uh, Pandora, of course, is the, fem the first feminine, the first female, who is opening that jar that contains the uh, all the, the problems and horrible things of mankind. And yes, this means that and something is opening and we should understand it, but we may not be able to. And on the south node, you have Dione, Plotinus, and the two fixed stars, Spica and Arturus, which I uh, showed you the, in the last video. I'm not going to um, repeat myself because it's no use. And on Dione, Dione is um, Zeus's first wife, first lover, and Zeus doesn't know yet that he is a chief god. So it represents young love, innocent love. Something like Romeo and Juliet, it's in, uh, except that in Romeo and Juliet both die and Diona is just being left alone. And uh, when Zeus realizes that he is the chief god, he simply turns his head and, and walks away and marries his youngest sister, Hera. Plotinus is a Neoplatonist philosopher. So you, again, you have a philosopher. And the two fixed stars are giving us, again, divine guidance, especially Spica. 
Okay. Uh, and we still have another thing in the London chart. We have a har harmony triangle and a mini engine. The harmony triangle is made up by two two sextiles uh, uh, closed by a trine. So that's moon, dark moon, and Juno. And the mini engine is made up by a uh, semi sextile, a queen kungs, and a trine. That's the mini engine. So let's take it apart and let's see what is helping us. The, the harmony triangle is funny because uh, the moon and Juno are brilliant because Juno is the, the first lady, so the wife, the official spouse archetype, and moon, the moon, is the mothering instinct. So actually, the two have a perfect harmony at the moment. But Dark Moon Lilith, which is the acceptance of the curse, at a, uh, is at its apex. So you, you still have a say in the matter. You still have your independence kind of secured. And then uh, the mini engine has Chiron, the moon, and Juno. And of course, Chiron is the chart ruler. And it denotes karmic wounds around anything that is linked to or related to Aries. So wars and fire and, and violence and destruction and, and even even all kinds of pain, of course. And this is a, a bi-directional quinkle. So actually you can rectify, you can heal your relationships as well, especially if you set uh, to the task your own soul or your mothering instinct. And the transcendental celestial objects are, uh, again, very prominent. On Chiron, you have Shiva and Lachesis. Shiva is the Slavonic love goddess, so there should be love uh, included in the healing processes. Lachesis is the um, um, the middle of the, the fates, providing um, your the fabric, the very fabric of your life by measuring it uh, uh, for yourself. And on the moon, you have Atropos, Albion and Mankar and Almach. Uh, Atropos is the the uh, third of the fates who cuts the things into um, into um, proper uh, uh, size. So it's the cutter uh, of the three fates. So two two of the three fates are prominent in this chart. Albion, uh, this was some this was a TNO I haven't uh, treated for a while. So let's revisit it. Albion is a mythological figure, an Adam Cadmon figure in William Blake's history and mythology. And he cuts himself into four pieces to create the four aspects of mankind. So it's also creation through dissection, but it is it's very different from Sedna, because Sedna is dissected by his own by her own father. And here Albion does it for himself. So it's actually like the, the embryo, which is growing. And uh, when you create something new out of yourself by dissecting something. And this uh this center, this TNO is appearing and disappearing for the last two years. And it was prominent at quite a few charts. And I, I kept saying that it may mean that finally the, uh, the uh, Ukrainians realize that they no longer have a country and soon they won't have any population either because, uh, because they are just, they're just being uh, exterminated. And it's a, it's a terrible thing. And hopefully something new and peaceful can come out of it. And then Almach and Mankar are two important stars. Almach is the gamma star of uh, Andromeda. So it's it's linked to feminine uh, joy and peace. And uh, Mankar, which is Alpha Cetus, the alpha star of the celestial veil, it occupies a, a liminal space between uh, Aries and Taurus, where there's the last uh, the last star of uh, Aries stops here, and then you don't have any more stars until the first star of Aries appears. So there's a this is a liminal space, empty space, where the the constellation set the, the veil is overtaking, and this means any type of um, idea or 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 notion or feeling that comes up to the surface from the depth. Uh, Menkar is the the, the uh, eye of the celestial veil. So anything that stares up to you and uh, stares you in the face to, in order for you to realize it. And then on, on the dark moon, if you have Sirius and Canopus, Sirius is the brightest star of the, um, of the night sky. 
it's it re it represents a sacred energy and Canopus is a southern constellation star Alpha Carina and you can't see it unfortunately from the uh, northern hemisphere so th those are oh and uh, th I didn't mention Nix and Orcus Nix is is the night the night and Orcus is the um, uh, the under the lord of the underworld of the uh, Etruscan um, underworld. Uh, so uh, and it so it's a Pluto like a Pla Pluto Hades figure, but it rules um, hidden treasures and also it is the punisher of broken oaths that is on Juno and that oath can heal now. So. Uh, listen to what is happening in your soul try to concentrate on your on your issues try to assess how you get got them how you receive them don't blame anyone else blame yourself blame your own inability to heal inability to change and try this try to utilize this brilliant energy that is above us on the 25th and it will it will keep being there on both on the 25th and the 26th. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.